ASMR. In tonight's video, we're going to be doing an NFL Week 5 recap video, as well as an NFL Week 6 waiver wire segment. So, if you play fantasy football and you are more interested in just the latter half of the video, feel free to check out the timestamps down below. And if you are interested in hearing all the action that took place this past weekend in Week 5, then, uh, you know, just stay right where you are, relax, and, you know, we'll start now. So first up on Thursday Night Football, we had probably one of the best games that we're going to have this season on Thursday night. This was a thriller between the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and the Atlanta Falcons. A overtime thriller, in fact. Both teams going absolutely berserk on the Buccaneers side of the ball. Oh, actually, let me announce who wins this game. Uh, so, though this game did go to overtime, the Atlanta Falcons end up taking the victory here with a 36-30 victory over the Buccaneers. Both teams move to a record of 3-2 and two, uh, to, you know, tie for the lead of the NFC South. So, on the Buccaneers' side of the ball, we have Baker Mayfield on an ultra-efficient day. He completes 19 of 24 passes for 180 yards and 3 touchdowns. Then, in terms of rushing the ball, we have Rashad White. He has 10 carries for 72 yards. And then finally, Chris Godwin in the receiving game with 5 catches for 64 yards. Now in terms of production, Mike Evans was the one with the touchdowns. I believe he got 2 touchdowns in this game. Uh, not a factor to be ignored. That put him on over 100 career touchdowns, by the way. So a big accomplishment for Mike Evans. Now, on the Falcons side of the ball, we have Kirk Cousins on Matt Ryan night. This is the night that they were... Uh, you know, memorializing Matt Ryan's tenure with the Falcons. Kirk Cousins goes insane. 42 of 58 passes completed for 509 yards, four touchdowns, and one interception. Those 509 yards were enough to get him the franchise record in just his fifth game as a Falcon. So, after a rough first two games, first three games, uh, you know, Kirk Cousins, that contract, seems like maybe there are good things to come. Obviously, no one was writing him off, but like this is what you're hoping for when you sign him to that deal. Next up, you've got Bijan Robinson with 12 carries for 61 yards. And finally, Drake London's breakout with 12 catches for 154 yards and a touchdown. Now, in terms of key statistics for this game, obviously, there wasn't a lot of defense being played, and you can only do so much about that. But, uh, as for the Buccaneers, I think it really just came down to clutch time execution on their end. With three minutes left in this game, you are up by some points. I think they're up three points. They fumble the ball away. That's a horrible time for a fumble. Now, luckily, it didn't really affect them they were able to manage to get the ball back with not that much time left in the game and all you have to do is waste the clock and maybe pick up a single first down and you've got it in the bag instead you run three plays for minus 14 yards and then give the ball back to the falcons they tie the game with a field goal and then a, they're the first ones to touch it in overtime so you lose the game so fumble plus three and out in the last three minutes of the game, that really is a losing formula. If they had just executed slightly better, you know, better ball security and better playmaking, less penalties, all these things in the last five minutes, they would have won. Uh, I'm not going to fault them too much, really, on overtime because they couldn't do anything, but also your defense allowed 550 yards of offense. So, transitioning into the Falcons. You had 550 yards of offense. That is definitely something to celebrate. This is something that everyone thought maybe the Falcons' offense was capable of. They couldn't quite get it. But now you're seeing those superstar playmakers actually live up to their potential. Drake London having a big game. Uh, even guys that you're not expecting, like Darnell Mooney, Ray Ray McLeod, uh, Kadero Hodge, all stepping up. Kyle Pitts had a good game for the first time in a long time. So... 
yeah, big, big game for this Falcons offense. Uh, I will say a little bit concerning. They do score 36 points. You had 550 yards of offense. You still need overtime to win, but that's truly really a testament to their defense, not their offense. So both teams work to be done on the defensive side of the ball, but great game for the Falcons. Um, and for the Bucks, you almost had it. Just tiny tweaks here and there. Next up, we had the London game, the first London game of this season. There's a matchup between the New York Jets and the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, the, oh, I forgot to pull up the score. The Jets would lose this game, uh, so the Vikings move on to 5-0, and winning this game 23-17, causing the New York Jets to fall to a record of 2-3. and Now, in this game, Aaron Rodgers 29 of 54 passing for 244 yards, two touchdowns, and three interceptions. Not ideal. Then you've got yet another la lousy game from Rizal. Uh Nine carries for only 23 yards. And then finally, Garrett Wilson, biggest game of his tenure with Aaron Rodgers so far. He had 13 catches for 101 yards and one touchdown, including 22 targets in this game. Now, on the Viking side, you've got Sam Darnold with 14 of 31 passing for 179 yards and one interception. Then, Ty Chandler being the leading rusher for this Vikings team with 14 carries for only 30 yards, not the most efficient. And then finally, Justin Jefferson with an adequate day uh, by his standards, six catches for 92 yards. Now, the fallout of this game was pretty impressive. Uh, let me just list out some of the key stats first. You've got, obviously for the Jets, three interceptions is not acceptable. Uh, that to one of these three interceptions being a big six, that is points you're gifting to the other team. If the Minnesota Vikings don't have that big six, you have more points than them. So, obviously, bad. And then, the last interception, truly an untimely interception. Uh, Jets had the ball, they were driving it down the field just outside of the red zone, and a spectacular play by Stephon Gilmore. I honestly don't know how he intercepted this ball. Uh, it was Mike Williams running a route up the right sideline. Aaron Rodgers throws it, and I guess, like, you could say Stephon Diggs has, like, inside leverage. He falls. He basically just looks like the ball is arriving, and he falls to the ground, or maybe he dives. I don't know. The angle makes it look like he falls, but he falls with the ball and uh, comes up with it. So, in the Jets trying to lead their comeback effort, pick, and uh, yeah, then the Vikings just kneel it out. So, with this start and the Jets falling to two and three, we have the owner firing head coach Robert Sala in a move that I don't think any of us really expected. I certainly wasn't expecting this. I know that Sala, like, hasn't been the most effective in the last couple years, and I know that this is probably a somewhat disappointing start. I drew 2 one two weeks ago, and then just back-to-back -back hard weeks. Honestly, it's more the Broncos game than this game, if anything, but uh, for Robert Sala to be out, especially after the defense that they had last year, him being more of a defensive-minded coach, I don't know. Uh, very interesting. Very interesting decision. We'll see how it bodes for the Jets, but man oh man, they are back into the losing column. And then for the Vikings, uh, you just gotta dip your hats to the defense. Uh, three sacks, three takeaways, only 36 yards rushing allowed in this one. Obviously, you had a pick six, so uh, Vikings defense, offensively, they couldn't do as much today, but their defense really picked it up and made it brought them to this 5 in a record, so this year, truly cannot predict it. Next up, we've got a matchup between the Carolina Panthers and the Chicago Bears. Now, I will go ahead and say that this was my worst prediction of the week. I had the Panthers toppling the Bears, and boy, was I wrong. Uh, the Chicago Bears absolutely demolished the Panthers in this one, one of the biggest blowouts this week. We've got the Bears winning with a margin of 36 to 10 over the Panthers, moving the Bears to three and two, and the Panthers to one and four. In this game, we see Andy Dalton finally cool off, 18 of 28 passing for 136 yards and one interception, no touchdowns. Chubb Hubbard, 
yet again a productive game for him 13 carries for 97 yards and one touchdown and then finally receiving the ball it is Jalen Coker uh, who dominance in that field Deontay Johnson severely shut down in this game by the Bears secondary now on the Bears side you have very impressive games all around you've got Caleb Williams 20 of 29 passing for 304 yards two touchdowns then DeAndre Swift 21 carries 73 yards one touchdown and then DJ Moore five catches for 105 yards and two touchdowns so uh, you know, I wasn't sure. Obviously, with the Rams game, the Bears played a lot more of a safe and clean football game. No turnovers. Wanted to see if they could do that again. And I honestly thought that the Panthers' offense was going to be a little more high-powered than this. But the Panthers' turnovers killed them. Three turnovers. It's like the Jets. You're not going to win very many games with that many. Uh, truly, the biggest limiting factor in their offense. And then for the Bears... Very impressive. You know, last week you had a conservative but effective game, and then Caleb Williams plays really well this week. Uh, you know, no turnovers. He has over 300 yards passing. He also runs for 34 yards. Uh, overall, you have 424 yards of offense, and you go three of four on your red zone trips. I'm impressed. I am truly impressed. The Bears are a winning football team five weeks in. Can't say that about a lot of teams that I even thought were going to be really good. Uh, it's been a very unpredictable season, and over the last two weeks, Caleb Williams has improved greatly. His development is definitely there, and this is exactly what you want to see if you're a Chicago Bears fan. So, hats off to him. He's, he's doing it. And, yeah, for the Panthers, kind of regressing back into your week one and week two state. Next up, we had a very fun matchup between the Baltimore Ravens and the Cincinnati Bengals. This game, uh, super high-powered, also an overtime thriller. Ultimately, the Ravens walk away with the victory, 41-38 to over the Bengals. This brings the Ravens to a tie for first place in the AFC North at a record of 3-2, and and the Cincinnati Bengals unfortunately fall to 1-4. Uh, in this game, you had Lamar Jackson, 26 of 42 passing for 348 yards, four touchdowns as well. Then you've got Derrick Henry, who had 15 carries for 92 yards and a touchdown. I will say that stat is a little bit misleading. Uh, Derrick Henry was bottled up for a majority of the day until a big 51-yard rip in the overtime period, kind of salvaging his entire day and winning the game for the Ravens. Then, uh, as far as receiving, you have Save Flowers with 7 catches for 111 yards. Now, on the Bengals side of the ball, you do, I mean, I feel for the Bengals because Joe Burrow has been playing amazing these last three games. You have Joe Burrow going 30 of 39 for 392 yards, 5 touchdowns, and 1 interception. In the rushing game, you have Chase Brown with 12 carries for 46 yards. And in the receiving game, you have Jamar Chase with 10 catches for 193 yards and two touchdowns. So, you know, the Bengals offense is doing its thing. Let's take a look at some of the key stats. Number one, for the Ravens, I've got Lamar Jackson's 348 yards passing circled. Now, obviously, the Ravens are a big rushing offense. Last two weeks before this, they had 270-plus rushing yards each. Uh, by their standards, this was a bad day in the rushing game. They did finish with 170 yards, but before overtime, that was more like 110. And Derrick Henry was sitting at like 45. No, probably like 40 rushing yards on the day. Uh, so they had been bottled up as far as the ground game goes. But Lamar Jackson showed us why he has two MVPs in his trophy collection, throwing for 348 yards and four touchdowns, uh, throwing to a variety of guys, you know, uh, to, to Isaiah Likely, he had one to Charlie Kohler, uh, really the ball's going anywhere, Rashad Bateman, Ravens getting it done, getting back in the win category, and showing that they deserve to be at the top of this division. The Bengals, on the other hand, I truly do feel bad for them at this point, because it's not the offense. The offense has been doing its job. 
uh, Joe Burrow in the last three games playing lights out. Uh, Jamar Chase has even turned it up in the last three games. But the defense has been atrocious. The Bengals defense over the last three games has allowed 103 points. That is crazy. It's over 34 points a game average. Uh, you cannot win games like that. And they're not. They're not winning games. Obviously, they beat the Panthers. But realistically, your defense has to get stops. And they just could not. You were even leading in this game for a while. But the defense... Something's got to change. Uh, and Joe Burrow he said, dude, he admitted in the postseason, post, uh, post-game conference, he said, this is not a championship team. We are not at that caliber. You know, I'm hoping that we can turn it around and we can get there, but as of right now, we are not there. And I admire the transparency. Like, I, I don't think that he's pinning blame. I think he's just being honest. And I'm hoping that will motivate the rest of the team because honestly, like, Joe Burrow has been willing and dealing. He didn't play that well in game one. Uh, I don't really remember game two. Last three weeks, he has been playing lights out. He, and the, the guy just cannot get any help from the defensive side of the ball. So, truly rough. Next up, we've got a painful matchup between the Dolphins and the Patriots. In this game, the Dolphins end up winning with a final score of 15 to 10. Uh, that moves Miami into a record of 2-3, and, and the Patriots fall to 1-4. and four. Now, in this game, Tyler Huntley, leading passer for the Dolphins, 18 of 31 passes completed for 194 yards and one interception. Then, in the rushing game, Devon Achan exits the game with a concussion. You also have Raheem Mostert, but he is a little less effective. That leaves Jalen Wright to lead the rushing game with 13 carries for 86 yards. And then in the receiving game, you have Tyreek Hill with six catches for 69 yards. Now, moving over to the Patriots side of the ball, we've got Jacoby Brissett, 18 of 34 passing for 160 yards. Uh, you know, the typical. Then you have Ramondre Stevenson with 12 carries for 89 yards and a touchdown. This was a little bit of a surprise considering that they announced Ramondre Stevenson would be serving as the backup in this game. He had been demoted to the backup, but after the first drive, he didn't really look like a backup, and he had a pretty serviceable day. And then in the passing game, you have Demario Douglas with six catches for 59 yards, and he was pretty nice. Now, as far as key takeaways in this game, for the Dolphins, you did something big here. You had 193 rushing yards. Now that is huge, especially considering the fact that Devon A. Jan went down so early in the game. He had three carries for 18 yards, and that was eight for him. Uh, but the 80 yards on the legs of Raheem Mostert and the 86 yards of Jalen Wright uh, really help in this game. You know, they dictated time of possession, a lot of ground game control. If you can rush the ball for that many yards, have a chance, you know, your, maybe your season's not fully over, over. As for the Patriots, now obviously I'm a fan, and I am going to have a little bit of a biased take on these situations, uh, but I think that the Patriots got robbed in this game. Um, I'm gonna read out this, this rule, this non-existent rule that I've never heard of, but apparently it's a real rule. Uh, the Patriots say with like Two minutes, two and a half minutes left in this game. They're in the red zone. They throw the ball through the middle of the end zone to Jalen Polk. Jokey Bieberset hits him on a dot. Jalen Polk comes down with two feet in bounds. Now, when I say two feet, I mean his first foot came down fully planted on the ground, and then he got his toe in before he stepped out of bounds in any way. And I think by the nature of a catch, by what a toe tap is by what toe drag swag means if you can get your second foot down inside the end zone before you fall out of bounds then that should be a catch so they rule it a touchdown then they go to review and they decide actually Jalen Polk his first full foot comes down like meaning his toe his heel everything but then his second foot even though his toe comes down in bounds. His heel comes down out of bounds. And therefore, it's not a catch. And to that, I have to say, what is this, man? <laughs> like, this is 
is bogus. Obviously, you're gonna have more hatred towards a rule when it is directly impacting your team winning or losing. But I have to say that is probably one of the stupidest rules in the NFL. Uh, I've never heard of it. I've never seen it in action. But if you have two feet down in bounds, how's that not a touchdown? I think that like, if I show, I will, I will show you what he did. And like, honestly, make it make sense. It does not make any sense that you can get an entire foot. Like, if you had gotten just his toes, it would have counted. But because he got a full foot, and then only his toe and not his heel, like, bro, why do toe touch catches exist? Like, it doesn't make sense. If, if he was facing the other way, and he got just his toes in, that is somehow more valid of a catch than an entire foot in just a toe. Like, it, it literally makes no sense. I think it's absolutely ridiculous, knowing the Patriots, they probably would have let the Dolphins still win this game somehow. Uh, the defense wasn't doing too well in the third and fourth quarters, but I do think they were dropped. They should have gotten the lead on that drive, and then they wouldn't have had to be in the position they were in. They probably could have hit a field goal at the end of the game instead of having to go for a full Hail Mary. Um, obviously, they had their own mistakes in this game, like a lot of penalties and things like that, but I think that, yes, I understand that the Patriots have benefited from many rules in the past. Uh, but if I was GM for a day, I'm changing two rules. This one, because this one is so dumb. And then I'm changing the fumble through the end zone rule. That being a touchback is also crazy. Like, if there are things that just don't make any logical sense, I don't understand why it's in the rule book. Yes, it is the rules. So I'm not going to, like, I'm not questioning the fact that we lost. We lost this game. Dolphins did nothing wrong. The fact that this rule exists is completely bogus. I, I, we should get rid of it. <laughs> it's so stupid. <laughs> Anywho, after that, uh, we can move into the Browns and Commanders game. This game, the Commanders, they've been rolling. They keep on rolling into another victory here. They win over the Browns 34-13, to uh, taking a 4-1 record to lead the NFC East. And the Browns, on the other hand, they fall to 1-4. So, very promising start to the season last year. Then, obviously, Deshaun Watson get hurt and you have Joe Flacco fill in for a while. They make the playoffs, they look decent, but uh, they've completely fallen apart. And yeah, it is abysmal out in Cleveland. The Cavs, sorry, not the Cavaliers, the Browns in this game. You have Deshaun Watson, 15 of 28 passing for 125 yards and a touchdown. Jerome Ford with nine carries for 47 yards only. And Amari Cooper with four catches for just 60 yards. No, are they Sorry. On the commander side of the ball, you've got Jaden Daniels, 14 of 25 passing. Believe it or not, that's actually like a low uh, completion percentage for him. It's it's pretty pretty bad by his standards. Uh, so yeah, 14 of 25. Then he's got 238 yards and one touchdown and one interception. So no, okay passing day. As for rushing game, also Jaden Daniels, 11 carries for 82 yards, so there it is. And then Terry McLaurin with four catches for 112 yards. Now, in terms of the key takeaways from this game, uh, on the Brown side of the ball, you allowed seven sacks again. There's There's got to be something that, that can be done, like just put someone else in at the offensive line, or like take more shotgun snaps design more quick routes, like, something is, well, something's wrong with Deshaun Watson, something's also wrong with the O-line, and the playbook is just not good, uh, if you're going to be allowing this many sacks to occur almost every game, so, I would recommend that they try and fix their offense, because it's been horrible, it, it has really been bad so far, as for the commanders, uh, you know, yet another victory, yet another great game by the rookie, and, uh, the thing I want to point out is the 215 rushing yards with an injured Brian Robinson Jr. So similar to the Dolphins, you've got your main pride and glory in the backfield not showing up, or not, not that he's not showing up, but getting injured. Brian Robinson Jr., I'm pretty sure he got injured in this game. Um, he had seven carries for 18 yards and two touchdowns. And then the 
the rest of the team just took over. You have Jeremy Nichols, 44 yards, Austin Eckler, 67 yards, and Jaden Daniels, 82 yards. So if you can get 215 rushing yards, odds are you're going to win a lot of games. Like, just look at the Ravens. I think you, I mean, you guys have more wins than the Ravens, but, uh, yeah, offense is going. It's still going. Like, you even had the opportunity to put Marcus Mariota in this game because you're up by so much. So, uh, yeah, just keep it up. You guys are amazing at the moment. <laughs> Alright, after that we're gonna move into a matchup between the Colts and the Jaguars. This was a very high scoring affair with the Jaguars finally picking up their first victory of the year uh, with a final score of 37 to 34. So the Jags move to a record of 1 and 4 and the Colts fall to a record of 2 and 3. Now, for the Colts, Anthony Richardson remained sidelined with that ab injury he suffered in the prior week. So we have Joe Flacco getting the start. He goes 33 of 44 for 359 yards and three touchdowns in this game. Absolute gunslinger, no interceptions. Then for the injured Jonathan Taylor, we have Trey Zerman filling in with 10 carries for 38 yards and a touchdown. And finally, Alec Pierce leading the way in the receiver room with three catches for 134 yards and a touchdown. For the Jaguars, we finally see Trevor Lawrence pop off once again. He has 28 of 34 passing for 371 yards, two touchdowns, and one interception. Uh, 28 of 34 for 371 is quite good, I must say. So finally earning that contract that he was given. Then in the rushing game, you have Tank Bigsby leading the way for the Jaguars running backs with 13 carries for 101 yards and two touchdowns. And finally, Brian Thomas Jr., the leading receiver with five catches for 122 yards and a touchdown. Now, in this game, uh, as, far as the Colts go, I'm going to say that you lost this game because you could not capitalize on the turnovers. Um, there are a couple instances, you know, the Jaguars, they did not play a clean game of football. They did turn the ball over twice. And ideally, that is where you strike, where you make them pay for their mistakes. And the Colts just did not do that. Uh, first instance is the Jaguars fumbling the ball. So the Colts take over. They run two plays. And on the third play, they fumble the ball right back. So it's almost as if the Jaguars go unpunished for their mistake they kick a field goal right after right before we go into halftime and ultimately that is the margin that you lost by so careless mistake and inability to you know convert turnovers into points and then the second instance is later in the game when trevor lawrence did throw his interception the colts got the ball uh, it was pretty deep in their own territory but they ran three plays and it was a quick three and out so nothing done there yeah, at least one first down or like some wasted time would have helped in some way but uh yeah the fact that you couldn't even push it out of your own territory because like i think they got the ball at their their own two yard line uh, so that punt is not going very far and then as for the jaguars uh, congratulations you guys had 500 yards of offense which is no small feat uh, including 371 yards passing so Trevor Lawrence, I think last week I said that like the run game was there. They had the rushing yards, they just didn't have the passing. And he del delivered on that. He over-delivered. You're not going to need 371 yards of passing all the time. But this is a great sign, the fact that he can do this, and that he did do this to get them their first victory. Uh, it's good. <laughs> I'm glad that he did. Um, hopefully it'll silence the hate for a little bit for him. But yeah. Next up, we had a matchup between the Bills and the Texans. This game goes in favor of the Texans. They win it 23-20, to 20, very close at the end there. Uh, that brings the Texans to a record of 4-1 and one at the top of the AFC South. And then the Bills, they fall to a record of 3-2 and two after starting an undefeated 3-0 this season. So for the Bills, you've got Josh Allen going 9-30 of 30 for 131 yards and a touchdown. Then we have James Cook, who had 
20 carries for 82 yards and a touchdown, and then Keon Coleman, who had one catch for 49 yards and a touchdown. Now, for C.J. Stroud and this Texans team, Stroud, I'll say he had an up and down day. He goes 28 of 38 for 331 yards, one touchdown, and one interception. And though it's not listed here, but I managed to catch a glimpse of this game, uh, Stroud also had a very costly fumble. Then Cam Akers is still filling in for Joe Mixon. He has nine carries for 42 yards and a score. And then against his former team, Stephon Diggs, leading receiver for the Texans wideout group, he has six catches for 82 yards. Now, in terms of why these things I want to point out for these two teams, uh, the Bills. I think the offensive woes are starting to kick in. We've got Josh Allen completing nine passes in this game. He went nine of 30. That is below 33% completion percentage. Uh, it's it's showing. It's you're you're starting to get figured out. You had a great start. Those first three weeks were phenomenal, but now your offense. Well, obviously you're also down uh, a player. No Khalil Shakur in this game, and so when your offense is already this thin, and then you lose a guy, it's it's over. You've completely folded. Now I will give the Bills credit. They did almost manage to climb back into this game and win it. So you're still doing your best, but I think you are delaying the inevitable. I think they need a trade. I think they honest, honestly need to bring someone else in for the wide receivers, because the tight ends are not stepping up. Dawson Knox, uh, sorry, not Dawson Knox, Dalton Kincaid, he still doesn't look like dominant in any way, shape, or form, and the other guys, they're just okay. It's a bunch of scraps. And for the Texans, I'm going to come in with some criticism, and it's going to be with those late-game turnovers. Like, you nearly choked this game, I'm not going to lie. Um, you had the, the interception wasn't as bad. You know, driving the ball down the field towards the end of it, you throw the pick. It's un unfortunate, but it wasn't as dire. The fumble was really bad. Like, CJ Stroud fumbling the ball deep into uh, the Texans' territory meant that the, the Bills... They didn't have to do very much. I think it was 15 yards, and they could have scored a touchdown. Luckily, the Texans' defense hold up very well and limited the Bills to just a field goal. But man, oh man, they almost completely threw that game away with that turnover. So, uh, just do a better job. Do a better job of fourth quarter game, game ball management because both of those turnovers did come in the fourth. And so, the Bills already had scored a lot of unanswered points, and you are just adding on to that. Uh, and yeah, I mean, luckily, you got away with it. So just work on that. Next up, we have a matchup between the Raiders and the Broncos. Las Vegas versus Denver. In this game, the Denver Broncos would come out victorious with a final score of 34-18. to uh, This brings the Broncos to a record of 3-2 and, and the Raiders to a record of 2-3. and three. In this game, you had Gardner Minshew on the Raiders' side of the ball going 12 of 17 for 137 passing yards, one touchdown, and two interceptions. And in the rushing game, we've got Amir Abdullah making an appearance. Uh, he had five carries for 42 yards and a touchdown. And then finally, in the receiving game, we've got Brock Bowers with eight catches for 97 yards and a touchdown. Honestly, Brock Bowers has been one of the best, if not the best, tight end in the league so far. Um, and a down year for tight ends across the board, obviously. But Brock Bowers, as a rookie, has been very consistent in showing up every week. So uh, let's give him some credit. I don't think that he's going to be talked about at all in this Rookie of the Year conversation just between what Gene Daniels and Malik Neighbors have been doing. But he deserves uh, some more recognition, I feel like, at least from my end. And then on the Broncos, they had Bo Nix, who threw for 19 of 27 passes, 206 yards, and two touchdowns. Then Javante Williams, who rushed 13 times for 61 yards. And Javante Williams was also the leading pass catcher with five catches for 50 yards. In terms of game stats that matter, uh, you've got the Raiders. They threw three interceptions in this game. 
uh, they actually did sit Gardner Minshew at one point, got Gardner Minshew going 12 of 17, and then Aiden O'Connell coming in going 10 of 20 for 94 yards and one interception. Now, I don't think that either of these quarterbacks is the solution. I'm a big, you know, supporter of Gardner Minshew over Aiden O'Connell. I'm a firm believer in that. But if you don't like what you like in Gardner Minshew, then your quarterback room, just throw it all away. Uh, these guys are not the answer. Uh, three interceptions by the two of them shows you, like, they're not good. At least not good enough to be where you want to be. So, you're going to have to draft a quarterback. You're going to have to trade for a quarterback. That's the only simple solution. And then as for the Broncos, uh, it is, you know, offensively, I think that they're still working through their woes. Not super impressive on the offensive side of the ball. Only 289 yards. Obviously a little more effective in the passing game. Um, but really, I like the discipline that they're playing with. Their defense has been showing up huge, uh, getting three takeaways in this game. And the fact that the Broncos offense did not turn the ball over is very significant because rookie quarterbacks, they can be prone to mistakes and like little things that are... It, it causes games to spiral out of control, out of your grip. And the fact that you were able to, to, to get a big six in this game, three takeaways, a big six, and you're not turning the ball over on offense, it's okay uh, to have offensive struggles if you're playing clean games like that. So, a great job by the Broncos offense limiting the turnovers and their defense. Then, next up, we've got the Cardinals and the 49ers. This game, feel bad for 49ers fans, uh, I can't lie. It's been a very unpredictable season for them. Like, uh, every time they look like they're gonna do good, then they just come back and give you a surprise loss. So, in this game, we had the Cardinals beating out the 49ers in the last quarter. Uh, the Cardinals end up winning 24-23. to That puts both teams at a 2-3 and record um, in the middle of the AFC West. Sorry, NFC West. For the Cardinals, you have Kyla Murray, who went 19 of 30, for 195 yards, one touchdown, and one interception. Then, you've got James Conner, who had 19 carries for 86 yards. And finally, you had Michael Wilson with 5 catches for 78 yards. On the 49ers side of the ball, you've got 19 of, uh, you've got Brock Purdy going 19 of 35 for 244 yards, one touchdown, and two interceptions. Jordan Mason has 14 carries for 89 yards, and then Brandon Ayuk has his best game of the season with eight catches for 47, 147 yards, but not enough as the 49ers lose this one. Uh, for the Cardinals, I will say, I think that the key takeaway here is Kyler Murray. Uh, Kyler Murray has 83 yards rushing in this game on a very efficient seven carries. And I honestly do think that is the best plan of action for them. If you want to win, if you want to confuse defenses, if you are looking to be competitive as an offense, you do need those design runs for Kyler Murray because that keeps the defense on their toes. So by establishing a good running game and just having Kyler Murray scramble out of the pockets for yards, whether it's designed or not designed, uh, that complements your passing game quite a bit. And unlocks a lot for this offense. And then for the 49ers, uh, there's so much to point out, but basically the entire second half was a dud. You didn't score any points in the second half, all 23 points in the first, and then your second half was truly atrocious, like one of the worst it could have gone. Um, here's a recap of their drives in the second half of this game. The 49ers start off with an interception, then they have a long drive, but it ends up in a turnover on downs. Then they have a fumble, and then finally they have another interception. Now, the turnover on downs, I'm not gonna fault them that hard for it, just because uh, their kicker, Jake Moody, did get injured in the second quarter. So ideally, the 49ers were in field goal range. It would have been like a 41 yard field goal, uh, and it was fourth and 23, but they didn't have you know, the kicking ability, so they decided to go for it on 4th and 23, and obviously they didn't convert, and, yeah, 
a truly a tough situation when you you're backed up that far. It's fourth and twenty three, so it's like ideally if you had a kicker, you're obviously just gonna kick it, but you don't have your kicker now, and fourth and twenty three is tough. So don't know what they really could have done uh, except for convert it <laughs> or brought out a backup kicker, but I don't obviously they don't have one. And then uh, another thing I wanted to point out. 49ers went one of six in red zone attempts in this game. Like, that is bad. That's really bad. You can't be going to the red zone six times and only score a touchdown on one of those trips. It is extremely inefficient. All that yardage and work getting down the field kind of has nothing to show for it. So, uh, I would definitely work on that. And honestly, I have to say that the 49ers are actually way worse than this scoreboard implies. 24 to 23 loss. But pretty sure seven of those points came on a like either a defense or special teams touchdown, and so your offense only put up 16 points. Not good, man. Uh, especially, I was saying it last week. Uh, the turnovers are more a problem. You, you beat the Patriots, but it wasn't a good turnover margin, and you had a lot of turnovers again today. So you're gonna have to work on that. Um, luckily. You know, the Seahawks have been falling, and no one is really at the top of this division, so despite the bad start by the 49ers, they are still in the running, but truly not good. Alright, after that we have a matchup between the New York Giants and the Seattle Seahawks. In this game, the New York Giants would come out victorious with a final score of 29-20. to Giants move to a record of two and three on the year, and the Seahawks fall to three and two after starting off undefeated three and out. In this game, we had Daniel Jones throwing 23 of 34 passes uh, for 257 yards and two touchdowns. Then in the rushing game, Devin Singletary was out, so we saw the backup Tyrone Tracy Jr. take over with 18 carries for. 129 yards, very efficient. And then finally, in the receiving game, no Malik neighbors. So Darius Slayton did his best impression with eight catches for 122 yards and a touchdown. Finally, on the Seahawks side of the ball, we have Geno Smith, who has 28 of 40 passing for 284 yards and one touchdown. He was also the leading rusher for the Seahawks in this game with four carries for 72 yards. A lot of, lot of ground game for Gino in this one. And then finally through the air, we had Tyler Lockett leading this receiver group with four catches for 75 yards. Now, as far as takeaways in this game, I have for the Giants, obviously the Tyrone Tracy Jr. breakout game being a very big factor for them uh, against the Cowboys. One of the biggest factors was the fact that they could not run the ball on the Cowboys after the Cowboys had just led up so many rushing yards to the Ravens. Uh, Devin Singletary was completely bottled up and then eventually injured in that game. So with Tyrone Tracy Jr. breaking out, uh, that allowed the Giants to amass 175 rushing yards total in this game. A big reason why I think they were able to win it, because they could establish the run, which is something they could not do uh, in the week prior. Now, on the Seahawks side of the ball, there's two main things. Uh, number one, seven sacks allowed on Geno Smith. That is never going to be okay. Anything past, like three, four sacks, you're hitting dangerous territories. Uh, definitely gonna wanna make sure you get him that time to throw the ball. And you know, Gino was doing a lot in this game. He was running, he was throwing. He just couldn't get enough done. Um, there were a couple turnovers, I believe. One fumble lost by the Seahawks. That would have been um, detrimental to their winning efforts as well. But the other thing that I actually wanted to point out was their three of 11 on third downs. So maybe that has to do a bit with the play calling, because the Giants, on the other hand, they went 7 of 16 on third down, and if the Giants are outperforming you on third down, I do think you have an issue. So, uh, the Seattle offense was working through the first three weeks to face the Lions, and I think that was obviously going to be a very tough challenge. I don't fault you for losing that one, but now this is a more bustling loss for 
the short handed giants to come into your home territory and hand you a loss, that is an embarrassing one. Uh, it definitely mitigates your lead in this division, and I would be slightly panicked for the Seahawks. Now, after that, we can move into the Packers and Rams game. This is a game in which the Packers ultimately came out on top with a final score of 24 to 19 against the Rams. This brings to the the Packers to 3 and 2 as a record on the season. This is also Jordan Love's first win this year. As for the Rams, they dropped to 1 and 4 at the bottom of the NFC West. In this game, we had Jordan Love completing 15 of 26 passes for 224 yards, two touchdowns and one interception. In the rushing game, we saw Josh Jacobs carry the ball 19 times for only 73 yards, but also a score. And then in the receiving game, it was another big Tucker Craft performance, putting up four catches for 88 yards and two touchdowns. As for the Rams, we had 29 of 45 passing for Matthew Stafford for 260 yards, one touchdown, and one interception. Uh, Kyron Williams carrying the ball 22 times for 102 yards and a touchdown. And then Jordan Winding, <laughs> Jordan Whittington with seven catches for 89 yards in this game. As far as key statistics go, uh, I would like to point out we have Jordan Love uh, very erroneously threw a big six in this game. He was deep in his own end zone, decided, let me not take the safety, let me just throw this ball out of bounds and I will save us from the safety. In theory, it's a good idea. Instead, he throws it directly to a Rams player. It's gonna be the low light of the season because they immediately scored six points and that was huge for the Rams in this game as they were barely, they're on the edge of a comeback attempt. Uh, so. If you're Jordan Love, don't don't force it. I mean, like, take the safety or like, make sure you're sailing that pass out of bounds. He was kind of falling to the ground. I, I do think that like when you're falling to the ground, just eat it, man. Like, it's not worth it. Most of the time, you're on the floor. The throw is gonna be so bad. It's going directly to the other team. And yeah, it, it really couldn't have gone any worse than what you're hoping for in that situation. So just eliminate that from your brain <laughs> and then for the Rams really it's just about limiting the turnovers if you had turned the ball over less in this game you probably could do it in almost every way your offense was better than the Packers like let's take a look in terms of passing yards you had more than the Packers in terms of rushing yards you had more than the Packers in terms of first downs you had more than the Packers in terms of third down efficiency you went 8 of 16 that is 50 percent and the Packers went 1 of 8. Now the big difference here is you guys turned the ball over twice and yeah in, in a five point loss that second turnover is really all it is so work on ball security if you don't turn that ball over then I think you probably are in a winning situation. Now after that, we can move into our Sunday night matchup. This was a game fought between the Dallas Cowboys and the Pittsburgh Steelers. Ultimately, the Dallas Cowboys would emerge victorious, uh, winning 20 to 17 over the Steelers. Both teams now sit at a record of three and two. That is back-to-back -back losses for the Pittsburgh Steelers and back-to-back -back wins for the Dallas Cowboys. In this game, Dak Prescott was you know, up and down, I would say. He had 29 of 42 passes completed for 352 yards, two touchdowns, but also two interceptions. Uh, for rushing game, we had Rico Dowdle leading the way. He had 20 carries for 87 yards in this one. And then in the receiving game, we have Jalen Tolbert, who had seven catches for 87 yards and a touchdown. Now, for the Steelers, the leading rusher, sorry, not the leading rusher, the leading passer was uh, Justin Fields, 15 of 27, for 131 yards and two touchdowns. The leading rusher was Najee Harris with 14 carries for 42 yards, not very good at all. 
and then finally you've got Najee Harris also being the leading receiver with two catches for 35 yards. I can show you the that that exemplifies how bad of a day the Steelers were having in the passing game. Uh, not all Justin Fields' fault. He did get injured partially through the game. Uh, I want to say at the very beginning of the third quarter that brought in Kyle Allen and yeah the Steelers offense as a whole was not that impressive in this one. So as far as my takeaways, uh, number one for the Cowboys, your turnovers are killing you. Uh, in this game, almost cost them the lead. It, or it did at times. You somehow managed to surpass your own mistakes, but three turnovers, especially two in the red zone, that is not okay. Could have won this game by a lot more. Instead, it was a three-point finish. Uh, and for the Steelers, you gotta capitalize on those. They did nothing. Their offense was really stymied in this game. Uh, first half, I think they leave with three points. In the second half, and the the drive that Justin Fields went down, they did still go on to get the touchdown. Uh, but later on, they had to get the touchdown when Fields was back in the game in the in in between segments with Kyle Allen. It was horrible. Um, so yeah, those other turnovers and things that went in your favor you just didn't do anything with them at all that really would have helped in a game like this um yeah so cowboys back in the win column they are competing close to the top of the nfc east and then the steelers still at the top but now tied with the ravens at both of them being a three and two record gonna take a quick water sip pretty badly. <laughs> and finally we can move into our Monday night game. There's a matchup between the New Orleans Saints and the Kansas City Chiefs. In this game, we saw the Kansas City Chiefs move to a 5-0 record after getting a 26-13 victory over the Saints. The Saints, after an impressive first two weeks, now fall to a record of 2-3. <laughs> Uh, in this game, we saw Derek Carr complete 18 of 28 passes for 165 yards, two touchdowns, and one interception. Then we had Alvin Kamara, who had 11 carries for only 26 yards. And finally, Rashid Shaheed leading the receiving group with four catches for 86 yards and a score. As for Kansas City, Patrick Mahomes had a pretty productive day with 28 of 39 passing for 331 yards, but one touch, sorry, one interception and no touchdowns. In the running game, Kareem Hunt saw a lot of work with 27 carries for 102 yards and a score. And then we had Juju Smith-Schuster lead the way for the receiving group with seven catches for 130 yards. As far as takeaways on this game, uh, for the Saints, it comes down to the rushing game. The Saints were only able to get 46 yards on the ground in this one, and the Chiefs on the other hand, like, they had 11 rushing first downs. The Saints got one the entire game. That is not going to cut it. Obviously, Alvin Kamara not doing that much. Jamal Williams also not able to do as much, but in order to to have any sort of respect in the passing game, you do have to first establish the run, otherwise they're just going to decimate you. Um, and yeah, that's kind of what happened. And then on the Chiefs side of the ball, 460 yards of offense, I will tip my hat to that. I did not know that they could do that, I wasn't expecting them to be able to do that. But still one glaring problem, the Chiefs made it to the red zone a very impressive seven times. I honestly, seven times is a lot. It's one of the most I've ever seen. But you went two of seven in the red zone, and that is not okay. If you come away with even two more touchdowns in that, you have such a more productive day uh, in a game that for a long time was a one-score game. Um, just know that you could have like converted more. I think that the play calling at the very end it needs to be slightly better. Uh, honestly, it is just injuries having to do with it as well. I am surprised that they were able to move the ball that effectively throughout the course of the game. Seven red zone trips is a lot, so I'm not going to fault you for going to have seven that hard because seven in itself is such a ridiculous number. But if you 
two on four of seven instead of two of seven. That's completely different game outlook. So, uh, yeah, I would work on that in Patrick Mahomes. Like, there's a lot of interceptions so far this year. It's probably the most I've ever seen. I don't know what exactly he can really do, uh, considering how battered and bruised everyone is. But, yeah, um, kind of a rough, e even though they're five and oh, I mean, they're perfect. They're literally perfect, but it's still, like, offensively, they do look stoppable. I don't know. No one can do it, but I, th I think it's definitely doable. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And with that, we conclude our week five recap. So that was all of the action in week five. I do want to touch on a couple major news cycles from this week uh, as far as like injuries go. So first up in the game for the Texans, Texans wide receiver Nico Collins. He uh, suffered an injury, a hamstring injury. So now he is being marked as day-to-day -day. and uh, the coach D'Amico Ryan has said that he could miss some time. And then we got Vikings running back Aaron Jones in the London game. He exited the game with a hip injury and is now being marked as week to week. The Vikings do enter their bye week this upcoming week, but Kevin O'Connell was non committal about his return against the Lions. So, something to monitor there. And then finally, earlier today, we have the breaking news from the Jets that they are going to fire their head coach, Robert Sala. Uh, very surprised move. I also saw reports that Robert Sala was actually intending on firing Nathaniel Hackett. So, uh, instead of, you know, submitting his time card, his time card got submitted. It is over for Robert Sala as head coach of the Jets. I think for right now, I don't even remember who is taking over, but they've got an interim head coach. Uh, truly a surprise, in my opinion. Uh, crazy how two weeks can change your entire season outlook. But yeah, uh, that about does it for this recap. So I'm going to take a break right here. Alrighty, so for those of you who have made it this far, welcome to the week six waiver wire segment of this video. This is going to be fantasy football waiver wire editions if you are someone that plays. So first up, let's talk about quarterbacks heading into week six. Uh, my first suggestion to you, this is going to be three per each positional group. We've got Kirk Cousins. If you did not hear, Kirk Cousins has arrived. He has emerged. He finished the day with over 500 passing yards and four touchdowns. So that shows you what he is able to still do after that Achilles injury and in this Atlanta offense. Now, I'm not expecting that to really happen again this season or ever. But even if he can have 300 yards and two touchdowns, that's a very serviceable day. If you're playing, uh, I mean, it, it, in any standard format, 300 yards is 12 points, and then you got the two touchdowns, and that's 20. 20 is good. Uh, I think he went for like over 35. So I think Kirk Cousins is worth a pick up in this week. He is currently only owned in 45% of leagues, so just under that 50% mark may be worth looking into if you need a quarterback. Then we've got Caleb Williams of the Bears. Caleb Williams, he has impressed over these last two weeks, I won't lie, uh, definitely done a lot of great things. Two weeks ago, or three weeks ago, he threw for over 300 yards, had a lot of interceptions and turnovers as well, but last week, sorry, two weeks ago, um, got rid of the turnovers, and then this week, not only did he throw for those passing touchdowns, he also got some yards on the ground, and he didn't have any turnovers once again. I think that this is pretty ideal. Uh, he also does have a favorable matchup in the upcoming week. If you're looking for a streaming option, uh, that matchup would be the Jaguars. The Jaguars are allowing a lot of fantasy points to opposing quarterbacks. Uh, we just saw Joe Flacco absolutely tear them up for over 300 yards and three touchdowns, so Caleb Williams, easy matchup in London. Maybe London time difference could have some effect on his game, but I, I don't imagine it will. Uh, and yeah, so he is also currently owned in 45% of leagues, so if you're looking for a plug-and-play worth uh, or even a stash for the rest of the season. 
And then finally, my third recommendation to you in the quarterback department would be Daniel Jones. Uh, Daniel Jones this week, one thing that I think is very notable in their victory over the Seahawks is the fact that he rushed 11 times. Obviously, he didn't pick up a lot of yards. I think it was still 30-something yards, but three points in fantasy is better than nothing, uh, considering like a touchdown is only four. And then on top of that, he has three finishes over 18 points this year, and he's going to go against the Bengals. We saw what Lamar just did to the Bengals. We saw what Jaden Daniels did to the Bengals. Andy Dalton also had a very solid game against the Bengals. Uh, and Daniel Jones, he is probably your best bet, only owned in 14% of leagues, so you could likely go out and grab him if you're really in need of a quarterback. Next, let's talk about our running back additions for this week. First up, uh, Tanks Bixby. I, I want to say that I recommended him last week. I don't know for sure that I did. I, I definitely was considering it, but in terms of things that I did, Number one, he outcarried Etienne. He had been kind of like close to Etienne's touches for a while. He finally did it. He outcarried him. He was way more efficient. Etienne's still kind of dealing with a shoulder injury. I don't know when that will be dealt with. Uh, but in the meantime, Tanks Bigsby has been growing and growing in his role. He's been way more efficient. He has taken over on red zone duties, and that led to two touchdowns this week. And he was the number one overall running back in week five. Kind of crazy, uh, considering he only had like 25 points, but that was the running back scene this week, and he has only owned in 9% of leagues somehow. So, seems like he is definitely stealing a lot of Travis Etienne's workload and job, and if Etienne continues to have this lingering shoulder injury, Big Speed is just gonna be better and better of a play. So I would highly recommend targeting him as the number one guy. Um, then number two, we've got Tyrone Tracy Jr. Uh, Tyrone Tracy, this week he showed us what he can do with a full workload. Uh, I do think that this is something I consider significant because Devin Singletary was so ineffective against the Cowboys that I, if I was the Giants, I'd be looking for that swap. Um, Singletary is not an impressive back. He, he's, he's not high capital. He's not being, he's not that talented. I truly think like he's okay, he's serviceable, he's okay. But if Tyrone Tracy Jr. has broken out, I would damn, I would very much give more of Singletary's workload to Tyrone Tracy, especially considering how many yards he got on how many touches this week. So I'm hoping that even if Singletary is back, Tracy is in for a much larger workload and he actually takes over the RB1 role in this Giants backfield. Uh, he's currently only on in 18% of leagues. Finally, we've got Ty Chandler of the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Aaron Jones is going to be out. Um, they're heading into a, a bye week, so this is not going to be ideal for you if you have a bye and you need to fill in. But if you have an empty spot on your roster and you're willing to take a chance on Ty Chandler, um, some things that might help you in your decision-making process. Number one, it was very efficient back last year, one of the best actually. His volume wasn't very high, but once he got more work, um, it got out of the shadow of Alexander Madison, he was good. Number two, Aaron Jones so far has been the running back eight, and the Vikings offense has been stellar. So if Ty Chandler does take over full duties against the Lions, then uh, you can expect a pretty good fantasy finish for him, or I guess a decent one. Uh, and yeah, I don't think that, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how long Aaron Jones is going to be sidelined for. Last year, I owned him, and his leg injury just kept on going and going and going. And when he played, he was good, but he also didn't play uh, a decent amount. So Ty Chandler, I definitely do think, is worth looking into. Now, after that, we will move into wide receivers. And I've actually got four wide receivers for you today. Number one, Jalen Tolbert. Dylan Tolbert is the next man up in this Cowboys offense with Brandon Cooks being sent to the IR. We saw what he can do with a expanded work for, uh, expanded role on this offense in the game against the Steelers. He had 10 targets and a game-winning touchdown. This shows that he has a lot of chemistry with Dak and Dak trusts him at any stage of the game. And right now he's only owned in 7.6% of leagues. So 
I would go out and get him. Next, we've got Juju Smith-Schuster. Juju had a very impressive week, even though he didn't score the ball. Eight targets with seven catches on 130 yards in a very depleted Kansas City offense. Uh, I do think that, like, defensively, yes, there's no more Isaiah Pacheco, and yes, there is no more uh, Hollywood Brown, or there never was, really. And uh, there's no more Rasheed Rice, but in terms of who they have left, I think that Travis Kelsey is going to draw a lot of attention, because teams are going to think if we can take Kelsey out, then we can limit Mahomes hugely. After that, see if you're worthy. I mean, they went out, they got him. We saw what he could do in week one. He's, he touched the ball very few times, but a big play threat. So I think they're going to focus a lot on Xavier Worthy on the outside. And that kind of leaves Juju to do the cleanup for the entire rest of the field. Uh, we saw him do that this week. I do think that, like, he is the biggest benefactor after one game on the Rishi Rice injury. And they did announce that Rishi Rice is going to be out for the rest of the season. And Patrick Mahomes is going to have to throw the ball to someone. So... Juju is probably your best bet in the Chiefs wide receiver room. Right now, he's only owned in 4% of leagues, so that should change quickly. Next up, we've got uh, Josh Downs. This is a recommendation that I make because I have to share what I've found. Uh, Josh Downs has been electric since coming back in the last two weeks. 21 targets, and he caught a decent number of those. Very productive in both weeks. Uh, let me pull up the exact stats. So, Josh Downs, two weeks ago, he was nine targets, eight catches for 82 yards, and a touchdown, total of 22.2 fantasy points. And then, this past week, it was 12 targets, so even more, uh, with nine catches for 69 yards, no touchdown, but still a 15.9 outing. Uh, and that's big, that's big back-to-back -back weeks of over 15 plus fantasy points. Now, the reason why I'm a little hesitant on this recommending Josh Downs is as good as all of this is. This was all done with mostly Joe Flacco at quarterback. Joe Flacco is not going to be the quarterback for this team. That's what Shane Steichen has emphasized. As soon as Anthony Richardson is ready to go, he will be the quarterback. And it does look like he's trending to return in Tennessee. And the fact of the matter is, Anthony Richardson is a much poorer passer than uh, Joe Flacco. Joe Flacco completes more passes. He throws for more yardage. And Josh Downs, I don't know if he can create the same stat lines with Anthony Richardson. Uh, running the show. So, take it with a grain of salt. I think it's worth keeping your eyes on, but that is something to be aware of, and that is why I have one more recommendation for you in the wide receiver department, and that would be Alan Lazard once again. Over the last two weeks, Lazard has 18 targets. Uh, I believe that was 10 this past week, and so far this year, the man has caught four touchdown passes. That is huge. So, You've got the New York Giants offense. I don't know what exactly is going to happen with the firing of Robert Sala. Garrett Wilson did have his breakout game, but clear-cut wide receiver two so far has been Alan Lazard. He is a red zone favorite of Aaron Rodgers so far, uh, as far as we've seen. And I don't expect them to stop throwing it. Like, their, their running game has been truly atrocious, and if it's going to be that bad, they're going to have to pass a lot. And Lazard definitely has some target commanding capabilities with Aaron Rodgers, so I would go check him out. Now, moving into the tight end department, this is the hardest week in and week out. It is the hardest uh, position to look for and to start. First up, once again, we're going with Tyler Conklin. Tyler Conklin, over the last two weeks, he has tied, he's not even tied, he is solely third in terms of most targets amongst tight ends, uh, and that comes with 17. He had a bounce back game, I think like last week against the Broncos, he was, he had a lot of targets, but I think the game um, just didn't go in his favor, so he ended up with not too many yards, a decent number of catches, but he still was tied for the most targets on his team, and then that paid off this week when he had a much better performance. And right now he's 37% owned. Tight end is such a 
bad position in fantasy at the moment. Like, no one is performing well. I do think that Tyler Conklin over the last three weeks has seen a lot of volume and is worth the pickup. Next up, I'm going with Kate Otten once again. This is the tight end for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. He was, he's been consistently third in terms of targets on this Tampa Bay offense. Uh, two weeks ago, pretty nice week. Uh, this past weekend, it it was okay. He had like seven-ish points, four targets, three catches for 44 yards, I believe it was. But hey, like it's not like anyone else better is really out there. Um, because I'm looking at guys who are owned in less than 50% of leagues, and it's just such a rough pool. If you got Tucker Craft last week, congratulations, you you did it, you made it out of this tight end nightmare. Um, but it's it's hard to find anyone, and yeah, um, this past week, Kid Hunt was third in targets. He, he is mostly that third option behind Chris Godwin and Mike Evans, and they're gonna draw a lot of the coverage. I think he almost scored a touchdown in this game, but ended up not being the one to do it. And so, uh, only owned in 16.5% of games. Very serviceable. Honestly, seven, seven and a half points. It is not that bad for mere tight end. It could be worse. Trust me. And finally, we've got an extreme sleeper. I truly wouldn't, like, I, I have nothing. I have nothing outside of these two guys as far as, like, week in, week out serviceable guys. If you are truly looking for a one-week plug-and-play, I can suggest to you Theo Johnson, tight end of the New York Giants. Uh, he's coming off of a very solid game, the best game of his career, actually, against the Seattle Seahawks. And uh, he faces an easy Bengals matchup. They just allowed Charlie Kolar and these other Isaiah Likely to, I think, burn them for three touchdowns against the Ravens. So Bengals are struggling against tight ends. Theo Johnson just had his best game. Granted, Malik Nevers was out, but I don't know. I like, as far as tight ends go, it's such a bad market right now. He's only owned in 1% of leagues, so you can easily get him in terms of productivity. I'm hoping, I'm hoping he can just have one more good week. And then, moving into defense and special teams, I've got two recommendations. Number one will be the Houston Texans. The Texans are going to be challenging the Patriots in the upcoming week, and it has just been announced that Jacoby Brissett will not be starting in that game. It will, in fact, be rookie Drake May. Now, Drake May has yet to play a full game of football. <laughs> and there's going to be woes. I don't expect him to come out and take the league by storm. This Patriots offense has other very notable problems. I think that the Texans' D-line will create an ample amount of pressure against our O-line. And, yeah, we... We aren't scoring very many points. I think in the last three weeks we've we're averaging like eight something points. It's not good. Uh, so yeah, Texans defense shouldn't let up a lot of points, and they're gonna get an easy assignment. After that, I would recommend to you the Philadelphia Eagles defense. Uh, and the reason for that being they're facing the Browns. The Cleveland Browns have been horrible on offense so far this year. Uh, still yet to put up over 18 points, and it doesn't look like it's changing anytime soon. Eagles defense, it's been an up and down year for them so far, but the Browns truly have been so bad on offense that it's almost like any team that's playing them, you may as well start the defense, so that's where we're at. And yeah, with that, we have concluded the waiver wire segment on this week. <coughs> the upcoming week six so uh thank you guys all for watching if you enjoy content like this feel free to like comment or subscribe i'll be putting out more videos as the weeks progress uh later this week you can expect the predictions video uh, i'll be putting that one out other than that i don't know i am i'm still trying to work on the schedule it's been rough trying to record sunday nights has not been easy either people are at our place or I can't record because our microphone wants to go to bed and I don't have a good way to block our bed from the camera angle and yeah it's it's just been tough so just two videos per week so far I'm looking to make a change on that we'll see if I can um, but yeah thank you guys all for sticking with me and
yeah thanks for watching and i will see you next time